Thank you, Erica, for inviting me to be part of today. And thank you all for that warm, welcoming applause. That was a beautiful moment. Thank you. I can really feel a circadia rhythm. Is that the right term, Al? Yep. But I know that I'm in the company of ideas people, of innovators, of, of visionaries and entrepreneurs. And it's a really, really tremendous feeling. Thank you. Uh, so what am I going to talk about today? Uh, the Great Unknown. It is very well known by big business and not well understood at all by the majority of small business and startups. I'm going to talk about some remarkable brands and present to you a very remarkable opportunity. Again, I know you, I can just tell from you guys, you'll know a great opportunity when you see it. And I'm thrill, thrilled and excited to present that today. So we've heard from the previous presenters about the effort involved in growing a business and growing a brand. And if you look at the brand of this region here, historically, we're exporters of electricity. It's very industrious. The Australian economy is really moving more towards a services economy. And we're seeing here now a new digital economy. So that pr provides great opportunities. You can, you can build a brand uh, from your lounge room. Uh, you can trade and you can promote yourself at the click of a button. And again, that is extraordinary opportunity, um, but also ex extraordinary danger if you don't do it properly. So, Arium, thanks again for the introduction. Uh, we're a local Gippsland consultancy. Half of our business is about helping people. People become leaders. We don't dance like that guy in the field. Um, but that's, you know, in continuous improvement, we might, might incorporate that. We help people manage people, make change. Uh, we also help businesses grow, startups and small businesses to grow and transform. Start off with, what is this, please? Sorry? Can we stand up? What was that? An esky. No, incorrect. Oh, uh, my lolly man, I forgot about that, sorry. It's a seat. <laughs> yeah, I'm a lolly for uh, your courage. Uh, which, which one is it? It's not an esky. Which brand is it? It's not a Coleman. It's a willow, you can see a little branding down there. What a remarkable brand that is, that despite how good your product is, uh, how well you promote it, others get the recognition for it. Imagine if the very good looking Marco Calabro stood up or, and everyone said, Ryan, you did a great job. <laughs> how, how do you think he'd feel about that? He'd feel a bit ripped off, I reckon. And Eric and I were just talking about the Clab Bros before. They're ridiculously nice people, uh, very talented, good looking. Um, it's just not on, you know. <laughs> uh, I think Bill Shorten's going to address inequality when he comes here, and I think it'll be number one on the agenda. So I'm going to talk about branding and intellectual property. Anybody know this guy? He tweeted some time ago that. Uh, Global warming was created by the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing uh, uncompetitive. Um, he is a brand. What's in a brand? A hell of a lot. Uh, you, you, a brand has a unique personality. It has a unique look, unique sound, unique message. A brand's got to fulfill a promise. It has a history. It has a backstory. It has certain values. Not really too sure what this guy stands for, but it's quite, quite remarkable that millions of Americans would uh, vote for such an egotistical man-child to, to head the, the top office. Um, another remarkable brand, Britney Spears, hands up here, who's a big fan of Britney Spears? Anthony, yeah, treasurer of the Australian fan club. 
Um, Brittany is a really big brand and again it's just highlighting that uh, a brand has a unique personality and there is a whopping big machine behind this girl, a whopping big <laughs> brand, branding machine, helping to commercialise her unique brand essence and her brand equity. And we'll touch on some of the intellectual property aspects of Britney Spears a bit later. So hands up who's familiar or seen the Apple brand, hands up high. Uh, keep your hands up if you know of Facebook. How about Virgin? Keep your hands up if you are a virgin. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, Okay, so full of sex crazed people. That's good. I'm feeling stronger rapport there. Circadia rhythm. Now these are remarkable brands. They've built brands over a long time. They've diversified into varying products and services. They've changed our lives, you know. None of us walk down the street without bumping into to people thanks to Apple. Um, and I just want to highlight probably the most remarkable brand the world has ever seen. And for this, I ask that you close your eyes. You are visionary, you're entrepreneurs, you can imagine things. Please, everybody, close your eyes. Listen to my voice. You're not closing your eyes. I'm at a safe distance. My name's not George Powell. Please close your eyes and just use your imagination. Okay, I want you to imagine that I have captured the breath of a thousand pigs. Keep your eyes closed. I've successfully bottled in a canister the breath of a thousand pigs. Please also imagine that I've just put a mask over your face, a respirator type mask, and I've got a tube running from that mask to the canister. Okay, I've now cracked open that valve, but I want you to take a deep breath, deep into your lungs, keep closing your eyes, and open them, please. Okay, who's, who's hungry? Yeah? That is phenomenal. If we all went up to, to the view from here and we see guys and girls build us a brand around a restaurant chain, a restaurant that serves food that you wish to create appetite for, and they came back and they pitched hog's breath, what the hell would you say to that? <laughs> now I don't know the difference between pigs and hogs. I'm not, I don't have the agricultural expertise, but I do know they eat their own shit and it's just not at all pleasant. Just to remind you, when you're there, when you're eating the food, they're still reminding you about that hog's breath. Absolutely remarkable. And with this, I drew a lot of inspiration. Um, again, I stay awake at night dreaming how rich I'm gonna be. Um, I dream of swimming in money a whole pool full of money. So there I'm in the pool swimming in the nude and I could feel the texture of the money on my body. Clearly it's not coins, that'd be abrasive, but I'm thinking notes and I'm thinking fans drawing it up, putting it into a big shower head. So I am swimming and showering in money. And I'm sure you've all had that same, same dream. So I went again up to the view from here and I sat down with John and I shared my dream with him. He was keen to hop in the shower with me. I said, but let me, let me just tell you what the concept is. So we sat down and we looked at Hogs Breath Cafe and we both agreed that is amazing. If they can pull that off, we can do anything. So with that, I said, I want to do the same thing. I want a chain of restaurants. I want a franchise. I'm thinking big. John's saying I'm liking it. John's haven't heard, John hasn't heard any of this yet. It's the first time. <laughs> no, no, yeah. So, so I said, uh, he said, what is it? I said, don't, I, I can't tell you. I want you to build me a brand. I said, everybody loves Jackie Chan. Everybody loves Billy Conley. And we all love food. What can you do? Several months later, they came back with something truly, 
truly unique. <laughs> Something truly beautiful. Um, it's obviously, you probably can't see the tartan there, but there's, there's tartan there for the Scottish, the Chinese love the red and the gold. Um, you now, John himself, he flew to Scotland. He, he paddled around Loch Ness in the canoe made of chopsticks and he served dumplings. He walked the length of the Great Wall of China uh, playing the bagpipes. He immersed himself in the culture. And what we're looking at here is a, tr a true cultural and culinary fusion like, like no other. How distinctive is that? Our signature dish, Szechuan Yes. But, uh, you're hungry, you're building, a, building up a hunger. Uh, we're going to retail that. We're going to have a very first store right here in Terrelgan. Because let's face it, there's not enough choice in this town. We need, <laughs> we need another restaurant. Start with one. More well, sale, we will spread and we will go. Ultimately global. Can anyone possibly see? Who wants to hop in the shower with us? Who wants to invest? <laughs> Who wants to invest in this opportunity? Hands up. I have $2.70. $2.70, <laughs> good, good. Hang on, I, I have spent tens of thousands of dollars on this. Well researched, I've got domain names, company names, business names. Uh, we've got all the signage ready in the shed, ready to go up next month. Well, I have spent close to $100,000 on this branding. And all I'm getting is, what, $2.50 <laughs> furthermore? <laughs> okay, I see, okay. So what problems uh, can you possibly see with that? So, <laughs> Familiar with what? With another brand. Yeah? Ah, very good. They, they certainly would. I showed this to my kids and I showed them an eight-year-old daughter and I said, what do you think that is? She said, Maccas. I said, no, it's not. It's, it's got a W. And she's going, but look, Dad. Look, Dad. Look, Dad, it's Maccas. And I asked my 10-year-old and he, the first thing he said was, that's a rip-off. <laughs> yeah, he might be right there. Why don't we make some changes, though? Go with the green rolling hills of Scotland. Can anyone see any problems with that one? Pardon? <laughs> yeah? Pardon? Yeah, which, uh, which giant supermarket that rhymes with Woolworths might, might take exception to that? Yep. So, what I'm doing inadvertently is I'm infringing the rights of others. And it's a very, very common mistake by small businesses and startups. They have their dream, and the people like me in business will say, do your canvas, uh, your lean canvas templates, do your due diligence, have you thought of this? And they say, no, 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 I'm a dreamer. It's, I know it's gonna work, it's gonna be grand. And they go down a path and they spend lots of time and money and they get to a point where they get some very nasty letters from, from some big boys. So with that, I want to talk about intellectual property uh, and its role in business. Why it's so important. So let's first look at it in a business context. On this side here, we have unregistered intellectual property, which is your secrets, your know-how, your competitive edge. Okay? Every business has it. You don't want your competitors to know about it. On the other side, we have registrable intellectual property. And Al will talk about the pains of, of patents. Uh, and they are a very long, costly, painful process. And we also have things like designs, plant breeders, rights, and trademarks. I'm going to talk most about trademarks today and its relationship to branding. And that's what you want the world to know. If you have legal title in a name or a mark, you're listening to the world, that's mine. Don't go near it, otherwise you get a nasty letter. 
Let's look at it from, uh, that was next slide, Ryan. So let's look at the purpose. We spoke about the whys before and the purpose. Why do you go to the effort of protecting your intellectual property? It exists to be able to protect the innovator. We've heard about the length of time again and money spent on bringing an innovation to the market. If there was no way of protecting that, you'd have copycats. You'd have the big boys that would say, great idea, little guy. I'll take that and I'll steal it from you. So there has to be a mechanism to protect the innovator. And that's what intellectual property is about. So let's look at it from a, a, a balance sheet point of view. Um, intellectual property is on the asset side. It is an asset. It's not like physical property, plant property and equipment and buildings. It's not tangible, but it's intangible. So when you're trying to build value in your business and you're trying to capture that X factor, that unknown that John Calabro and, and gang are really good at creating, that's a legitimate asset on your, on, on your balance sheet. You can go to the Red Book for Vehicles. It's pretty well regulated what the, the value of your physical assets are, but the intangibles in your brand um, is something that's, that's scalable. And it can add substantial value. Coca-Cola has a vast majority of the value uh, on their balance sheet in trademarks. So again, it's becoming so important to protect your brand. And I'll take you through that a bit later. So I will gloss over patents. Um, but patents are long, painful things, very expensive. And they have a finite life. They have a 20-year life. Um, what else can I say about patents? I would say in today's world, when you're trying to differentiate yourself, when you're trying to get into the market, speed to market is really important. You can try to protect your innovation via a patent, but nine times out of ten, you just got to outmarket your competitors. It's about being first to market and getting that penetration and getting that investment. Because if you're waiting on a patent strategy to create that opportunity for you, patents, you can work around them a bit too. They're, they can, they're not all that valuable in many instances. Okay, so but speed to market is is the best thing to do nine times out of just get there and, and, and get the product out there cost effectively, get the money rolling in the door. Trademarks by comparison are incredibly cheap. So what is a trademark? It really is a mark of distinction in your products or your services. So we spoke about Esky before. You know, they've built goodwill and reputation in that name so, so well that others call their products Esky. Uh, types, what, what are word marks? They can be letters, they can be numbers. Taylor Swift is trying to register 1989. She's got a trademark. Let's party like it was 1989. Uh, she's got a trademark for this sick beat. Uh, Taylor, Taylor Swift is hemming us all in. We're not going to be able to say anything soon without giving her a royalty. So they can be words, they can be logos, they can be shapes and colours, you know, the familiarity with um, Cadbury, they own that purple. Uh, David spoke earlier about Centrelink and the relationship to the orange colour. Uh, sounds, uh, Tarzan's Yodel, that's a trademark. Smells, with, uh, with perfume. But the most common ones, which I'll touch later, uh, is words and, and logos. So also aspects of, of packaging. So a really common misconception is that if you have a domain name and you have a company name and you have a business name, you're fine and dandy. Well, a trademark, a registered trademark will out trump them all. Every single time, because a trademark gives you exclusive right, exclusive right to trade in a territory 
or a country with that name. And no one else is allowed to. So again, the two most common mark types are word marks in standard typeface and then the device marks or the graphics like um, the Nike tick. Uh, trademarks also cover how something sounds. So if you had uh, Aussie might, A-U-S-S-I-E, or use a, a Z type derivative, the fact that it sounds the same, you can be infringing the rights. So as I mentioned before, you, when you register a trademark, you register it per class, per country. So there are 45, under the niche, uh, niche agreement, there are 45 classific uh, classes of goods and services. And I use the example of Dove there, is that um, Dove is a trademark in two separate classes. And the consumers don't get confused because they're so different. So that's why you can have Dove in class three for soaps and in class 34 for food and chocolate. Unless you're being naughty and your mum makes you eat the soap, you won't generally get confused. So just to understand the process that you go through when you apply, this is the Australian process. And IP Australia is a registrar of patents uh, and trademarks amongst other IP. And this process takes about seven months. So if you have an idea for a great name or a great brand that you want to release into the marketplace, you really have to think to register or apply for registration first. Because it's uh, like that prior art, when you release something into the public, it's no longer your exclusive property. So it's a bit chicken and egg again, sorry for all these, uh, all these references, um, but you've got to have an idea of what you want to protect in your product and service scope and have an idea of your branding before you start. So how do, what's, how's the process work in Australia? Okay, there we go. So we have recently introduced what's called a Head Start program. And that means that you can apply for your mark in classes and list the corresponding services that you wish to, to provide or products. And you can do that per class for $200. That's really cheap. Now what this is, it's the confidential process. And what they do is they compare the mark that you've submitted to marks already on the database, the Australian database. And they will tell you pretty quickly whether there's something deceptively similar. Just like Marco and I, confusingly similar. Yep. They will tell you very quickly whether something is deceptively similar. And they will say, no, nah, you can't register that mark. But if they say, yeah, we can't find anything similar or we can't find anything via Google search, that is obvious, uh, will you then have to apply for it. And so you start to apply for it, you pay another fee, $130 per class, and it takes five, oh, bugger. Here we go, sorry. Just be careful with this thing. Um, it takes five months for them to process that application. Why does it take so long? Uh, it's a good, jolly good question. Um, but Australia is party to an agreement with uh, 100 other different countries. And so when you start to apply, you set what's called a priority date. And therefore, that gives you six months to apply for trademarks in other countries because those countries recognise the Australian priority date, thanks to that agreement. Equally, when you're applying for a mark, it enters what's called the opposition period. And that's after the trademark is assessed that they can't find something deceptively similar. They then advertise it publicly because they give others the opportunity to say, hang on, we might not have a registered mark, but we've developed goodwill and reputation in a deceptively similar one. So we oppose your application. It's the only window they get to oppose. The big boys have search services. They have attorneys that provide this service all the time. And with uh, Google searches and a myriad of other algorithms, it's so much easier for them to find the first sniff of your application. 
it's getting harder and harder to get, get them through. If there is no opposition, your mark proceeds to registration. And unlike patent, patents, trademarks last forever. So that, that fee, that initial one will last for 10, 10 years and you can then renew that every 10 years for $300 a class. So it is incredibly cheap form of property. One that pays dividends, one that adds considerable value to, to your book value, to your balance sheet. Let's look at our friend Brittany again. So in 2004, Brittany's team over here in New York, they registered the mark, a word mark, Brittany, in nine different classes of goods and services. So fragrances, uh, music. Look, 2004, it's got uh, pre-recorded audio cassettes. Uh, we've moved pretty fast since then. Fortunately, there's one thing called and other digital media featuring music, featuring music. But clearly, they had a vision at a point in time. And the best thing with trademarks is you grow into them, not grow out of them. So you need to think visionary, where I want to be at a point in time and what the products and services that I want to grow into. Now, there is a rule, you've got to use it or lose it within three years. Um, but that's if an opponent comes and says, hey, you haven't used it, they, you, know, you, have to, you have to remove it. But in essence, you've really got to grow into it. Um, what else has Brittany got? All printer material in class 16, uh, leather goods and wallets and so forth. 25 is all the clothing, um, footwear, headwear. It goes down. The last one is 41 entertainment services in the nature of performances by a musical artist. So none of us in this room can head up a musical career in Australia and perform live, calling ourselves Britney, without infringing uh, her sole and exclusive right. So you can appreciate that when an artist, no matter how talented they are, there's a whole team behind there that has to find a unique identity and a unique brand. And they go to the great lengths of registering all this IP to protect that equity, to protect that value. So getting back to my friend here, let's say that you all invested, which I'd encourage you to do, and we have launched. What do we think would happen? Mixu. Sorry? <laughs> Mixu. Brilliant. I've got a trademark for Mixu, so you can't use that. To, that, that is an <laughs> exceptional answer. But hang on, I, I, I wasn't aware of them. Um, I didn't do it deliberately. Surely they can't pursue me. Yeah? Right, so that mark, that beautiful creation of the view from here, go with it, John, was deceptively similar. It was passing off. So passing off is a common law term where you're representing your goods and services of those of another. You're ripping somebody off. I'm leveraging off the brand equity that Maccas has established for, for many, many years. How am I looking for timing, mate? I'm going to... Four, thank you. Okay, so what can Maccas do? They can McSue me, thank you. So what can they do? They can sue me for a lot of things. If I'm in business for any length of time, they can sue me for the profits that I have derived. They can sue me for any loss of income or damage to good, their goodwill. And when they take me to court, and when they win, because they would, they will sue me for their legal costs. Right. So here I am, a small business with a grand vision. I've started, I've gone for a length of time, and then I get this letter that frightens the living shit out of me. I can tell you that happens every day. Just this week, a client said, what the hell do I do? I've been in business for three years. These big international brand is telling me that I have to shut up shop. And they told them all those things and you've got till November 2017 to change your name, 
to bring down the website, to stop trading. Otherwise, we're going to sue you. This is happening more and more often every day. And Maccus doesn't care if you did it inadvertently. That's what happens... That's what happens 999 out of 1,000 times. Okay, I guarantee you, you'll get those letters. I'd just like to talk about an exceptional case here. And this is about Dick Smith. So early 2000s, he released, true story, he released matches under the brand Dickheads. <laughs> yep. So the... Swedish, okay, Swedish, Swiss, Swedish brand owns the trademark in Australia for redheads. And Dick Smith argued that while he was happy to concede that he did copy the concept of the packaging of redheads, uh, he said there were careful measures taken to make Dickhead's packaging significantly different from Red's head, Redhead's packaging. Can anybody here point out the significant difference <laughs> in that? What was in the box? Matches. <laughs> yeah, good point. The other champion of the little Aussie battler also has introduced Aussie might for about a dozen years. Uh, you would agree, nothing at all similar remotely to Vegemite. Right. This proves if you've got a big enough wallet, um, you can circumvent due process. Right. So it can happen. It's again, it's a big boys got the big money, but look, it really is a quite an exceptional circumstance. But as little guys here, we just have to put the right protection in place. That'll um, where we're looking looking good for the majority of cases. So let's look at some Gippsland brands that have been developed and they are protected. View from here, in what they do, in three classes, they own it. They have a monopoly. No one can trade anything deceptively similar to the view from here and pass off on the goodwill and reputation they're building. Gippslandia, in my opinion, are the best brand that's ever been invented here. You know, a, a good brand should have an emotional connection that makes me extremely proud that it's such a visionary brand um, that celebrates the good, good stories of the region. Uh, very quickly, this one's a really interesting, Clark Next RE. The trademark for that, Clark Next RE, real estate in Warrigal Jew in Melbourne. They came to John and they said, we love the word next because it's just got a great feel about it. It's progressive. Love next. John said, Ryan, can we trademark that? I thought, oh, well, it's going to be hard because the trademark has to be distinctive and it can't be descriptive of the goods. It's a whole heap of criterion. It must be distinctive. So like find Izzy. Yep. Um, and so we couldn't really ordinarily get that through. So we had to treat that as a word mark and we didn't differentiate the word next and RE. It was all just the one thickness, nexta. Like rhyming with dexter. So we had to go through the trademark and we, we were, were hoping like hell we'd get that through. We got it through. They interpreted it phonetically as nexta or nextra. There was no connotation with the word next in it. So it's through as a word mark, but graphically it's differentiated by the, by the thickness. So there's, there's a lot of grey areas in, in trademark and the marriage to branding. Anybody here can get an IP Australia, they can register a mark but you can very easily poke the bear. You know, it's doing your own conveyancing, very similar. Uh, you can do it, but it'll be a high risk. Talk to people that, that can. Uh, all right, so what have we learned today? Yep, eskies aren't necessarily eskies. We know what pigs, pigs can eat. Dick Smith can have his way uh, with redheads and not many of us can. Uh, I still maintain that Gippslandians uh, are an incredible bunch. We are innovative uh, and I'm really lucky to work with creative agencies across 
Gippsland to, to see what they create uh, and to see that, that differentiation, that intangible quality that makes them stand out and, and builds value. As I said, the digital era here, we've got opportunities like never before, um, but, be, but do it cautiously. If you've got a big idea, it's beyond just your little town here, and it's on a national scale or even an international scale, you have to have a trademark, otherwise you are going to get nasty letters. And if you haven't done the due diligence already on a mark that you already have, have a look to see if you're infringing another, because you might just be stepping on someone's toes. And it's happening more and more often. So I think I'm out of time. Um, <laughs> if you do want help in understanding how to protect a brand, um, protect your interests, uh, you're welcome to give me a call. Thank you. Not if I do it first. <laughs> well, there's an example there. Oh, okay. I'll just go back to that time frame. So, you've been trading for years under a name, under a brand. You've built goodwill and reputation. I might be cunning and think that's a damn good name. I'm going to apply for it. And if you're not paying attention to that yellow bit, to the public journal, you don't have an attorney that's doing that for you, then I might just get that name and I'll get legal title of that. So what do, what do you then have to do? You have to take me to court. And you have to argue that you have legal title over that name. Yeah. So on the flip side, if you've got a trademark, it's a very easy argument. Every dispute goes to a federal court uh, scenario. It's about having the strongest evidence behind you. Apply to what, sorry? Patents. You know, you were saying before that you can't deliver it to the market because you can't register it afterwards. Uh, no, I'm sorry. You, you can register at any point in time. But the point being that if you've got the most fabulous name or fabulous brand and idea, um, others are likely to, to jump on that. Uh, okay, I would say me, but um, <laughs> no, well, it's, I'm not an attorney. I've had years of experience in buying, selling and licensing trademarks and advising on trademarks. Um, an attorney is like any technical person. They'll tell you a black and white answer for twice the fee that I will, but they won't necessarily understand the relationship of the brand. So your brand's got to come first. You have to communicate and solve the problem and you have to communicate. Branding is number one. The trademark has to protect that brand. So you, wouldn't, you never start with a trademark. Okay? It's got to make sense as a brand. So that's where I get involved and I work hand in hand. And for new brands, sometimes John and I will do a merry dance and he'll come up with some concepts. And then I'll have a look at those as compared with others on the database and in the marketplace. And we'll refine those concepts and also steer clear of that colour, steer clear of that shape that can't look or sound like that. And so from day one, we build a brand that, 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 that can be protected. But the, the answer to that is uh, a trademark attorney. Um, and I use, I use one as back-end and great advice. Uh, his name's Chris, uh, Chris Round, terrific fella. He's over $600 an hour. It's a really specialised field. And so with the change in the digital economy and with that growing threat um, and the fact that small businesses don't know much about it nor can afford those sort of fees, that's where 
there is an enormous opportunity to help. And that's all, uh, in one area, area that we're concentrating on. So, yep. Maybe I should pay, hire you and pay you to answer this question for me, but the Productivity Commission stated on Friday that they would think that the innovation patient should be phased out and the federal government uh, agreed with that yesterday. What's your opinion on the impact that that would have on innovation and small businesses in Australia? Massive startups, particularly. You know the process of going through a patent application. Um, and they're expensive and obviously that provisional one you're talking about is quicker and cheaper. I think it's going to really kill small business and startups. Well, kill, it's going to have a massive impact. Yeah. Well, again, domain name is just a, a digital PO box, really. Um, and if you have a trademark uh, in Australia or anywhere in the world, um, what I didn't mention is the World Intellectual Property Organisation. It's the worldwide authority, um, and Australia's party to a lot of the, lot of agreements. So again, you have a trademark per per country. Um, there is what trademarks do is they protect goodwill and reputation. So goodwill is derived from selling products and services. That's a commercial activity. Uh, reputation, however, can be a promotional thing. So you can create reputation without actually trading. And you can be inf infringing in that regard. And what bottom line is, is if I've got a domain name, a, a trademark, and you've got a domain name that's deceptively similar, uh, phonetically or in, in how it looks, I can, I can have that removed. I have legal title over that name and that mark. Yes, David? Great, great presentation. Yes, we have registered for us busy at all, but the folks around us busy. Um, but my question was more one of the logos you put up there before, quick real estate .com that I do with the folks that are fixed with here in uh, Gippsland, kind of how they wouldn't run a power REA group with real estate .com that I do. Well, um, tell me how much time I've got. Yeah. So, REA Group, um, realestate.com.au, they own realestate.com.au as, as, as a trademark. That sounds nothing like quick real estate. And the real estate component is the description of the service. You can't register a service and say, hey, I'm the only lawyer and they can trade as a lawyer or, or as a real estate agent. So the differentiation is what's up front. So in that instance, it's quick. And then John did a great job of creating the cue and the clock for distinction. All right, so it's all about having a distinctive element. It's called a badge of origin. Um, in way back when you made, uh, say, products and you stamped them with your badge, you could see the origin of where it's manufactured. Nowadays, in the digital realm, it pertains to the distinctive qualities composition, shapes, sound, you know, phonetics of a mark. Um, very informative presentation, first of all. Uh, I've learned a lot. But one thing I'm wondering, though, is where is that line between infringing on someone else's trademark? Because you've, you've used the example of um, blocks, and then you've shown us how, like, Pete Smith, right, which is, uh, seems to be trading on. And there's stuff like, I don't know if you've ever been through the frozen food section of a Coles or a Safeway, they've got buckets of SFC in like a sort of Kentucky Fried Chicken and it's in a bucket and everything. So I'm wondering like, would that have walked, would that, like, can you get away with that? You know what I mean? Is it really just, if they're bigger than you, you lose? <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, <laughs> now, it is a fine line at times and it's trying to find that point of differentiation and those who can pay the, the attorneys to find that yeah. and grind you out they will always win. They will always win. But I didn't mean to confuse you with Dick Smith. I just wanted to show you that there is, in very rare instances, when you have enough money, you can win the argument. But none of us in this room would get away with selling dickheads in that packaging. Well, I have a feeling we're about to break for lunch, yeah. so if, if it's okay... Questions, yeah, during lunch. I would love to hear from any of you personally. So I would very much like to thank you because it was a very interesting presentation. Thank you, Ryan.
Thank you, Anthony. Thank you very much.